All right, cool. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Kum and uh, uh, currently pursuing a master degree in management science and engineering. Also part of the leadership um, team at uh, Stanford Blockchain Club. Um, so um, in Blockchain Club, we try to um, become the thought leader um, in the blockchain technology and everything crypto, cryptonomics um, uh, in, the, in the Stanford community. Um, so I will share some of the links we have, like we, we use um, uh, email and also Discord for main uh, communication channels. Um, and uh, also we're doing a accelerator program to incubate uh, Stanford uh, startups uh, using a more kind of crypto native way. Um, that being said, uh, it's a great honor today to have uh, Mike uh, Garland and Nitesh Sharma to join us today from um, uh, Alchemy. That being said, I will let uh, Mike and then Tish to introduce. Awesome. Yeah, uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, my name is Mike Garland, uh, Stanford class of 2013. I was a uh, CS undergrad uh, specialized in AI. Um, started uh, started out after school as an engineer at Palantir, um, started my own company, got acquired um, an event at uh, Alchemy on the product team uh, for a little over three years now. Um, so happy to talk about any part of that journey when we get to questions, but um, particularly I've seen uh, a lot of the journey in the life cycle of a startup at, uh, at Alchemy. So I'm um, happy to dive into any of that stuff. And Natish, you want to uh, introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mike, so much. Um, been a pleasure to work with Mike over these past month. Um, but yeah, my name is Natish. I'm a Stanford CS undergrad studying systems. Um, may or may not get the code term in AI, we'll see. I'm currently on leave working here at Alchemy on the go-to-market team, doing some engineering work as well. Um, having the pleasure to work with Mike every day has been a really uh, great experience and mainly just uh, here learning a lot about the infrastructure space and trying to bring sort of the power of blockchain to as many people as possible. But um, yeah, like I said, I'm also happy to answer any questions for those who are interested. Awesome. Um, so start, um, do you guys have a presentation you guys want to go over or you want to do some background about Alchemy? Yeah, let me uh, let me share my screen quickly, and we can go to a quick uh, quick background on on who we are and what we do. Um, can you see the uh, the screen? Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Um, perfect. So, um, I guess before we jump into specifics on the company, some background on our our industry and and kind of why we're we're paying attention to this the uh, this part of technology in in the first place. Um, so, from our perspective, there there have really been three major shifts in technology over the past fifty years. Um, computers, uh, which allowed machines to follow instructions, like greatly magnifies what we're able to do across a wide variety of use cases, obviously. Um, the internet, which allows machines to exchange information, um, no longer is a single machine uh, kind of isolated in what it's able to do, but obviously massive networks that enable, again, entirely new use cases. Um, and with blockchain, we see kind of the third evolution of, of, of that skill set. So machines now are able to exchange value, um, which again, as uh, computers and the internet did, uh, opens up uh, an entirely new set of possibilities and an entirely new set of use cases um, that a whole industry can develop around. Um, and so as far as where is we, we fit in that industry, um, we've seen a pattern with all these, these kind of evolutions. Um, so starting with the, uh, the PC revolution with computing, um, you see that you know, the, the first step is there are these primitives on which developers build. In the uh, PC case, that's RAM, CPU, hard drives, kind of the underlying uh, technical primitives of, of the space. Um, what you want to get to is this application layer. So uh, powerful things that are enabling end users to do um, some incredible stuff. And the way you get there is you need to increase uh, the kind of usability of the, uh, the underlying primitives, these, these kind of hardcore technical concepts. And that's where the, uh, the operating system layer comes in, in in the PC case. More generally, let's call that the platform layer. Um, when we extend to the internet, we see something similar happen. You have these underlying protocols, HTTP, FTP, SM SMTP, really amazing enabling powerful things, but they're very hard to work with. How do you get to Netflix, Airbnb, and Uber? You need a layer like AWS to abstract away a lot of the complexities of building with those underlying primitives. Um, and so the same thing applies to blockchain. You wanna build NFTs, you wanna build exchanges, all these amazing things that DeFi is enabling, but doing so with the underlying technical primitives is in a lot of cases really, really difficult. Um, and so where we come in is we uh, kind of remove that difficulty. We build levels of abstraction. We uh, abstract away the, the kind of problems of building on blockchains directly. So you can spend more time building differentiated products. Um, some background on us as a company. 
Um, so what we're building is, is fundamentally a blockchain developer platform. Um, so taking all of the needs uh, of various kinds that developers have as they build a product using blockchain and solving those needs one by one, kind of climbing up the, the hierarchy, hierarchy of needs that they have um, in doing so. Um, as we've done that, uh, super fortunate to have uh, some partners around us that are, are really, really incredible um, on the investor side. Folks like A16Z from our most recent round um, and angels that have been, been around with us for a long time, like Charles Schwab uh, and the one that catches everybody's eye always is, uh, is Jay-Z. Uh, so super fortunate on that end. Um, and we have one of the most talented teams I could possibly imagine. Uh, definitely the most talented team I have ever personally worked with. Um, from scaling kind of a hardcore Web2 infrastructure at Google, Facebook, Microsoft, um, and from amazing universities like, uh, like Stanford. Um, and the results have been pretty, pretty amazing. So um, in the Web3 space, we are powering the vast majority of projects that are doing uh, cool things across uh, basically all use cases. Um, if you zoom in on the most popular use cases like NFTs and DeFi, it's no different. Uh, most of the large uh, platforms and individual players are using our tool set and our infrastructure to do what they do. So folks like OpenSea, Immutable, Axie Infinity, um, some names I'm sure uh, you're familiar with, they're all using our underlying APIs and developer tools. Um, and as such in, in DeFi, uh, similar, we power I think greater than 60% of all of the total value locked in DeFi. Um, through the projects that we're working with, like Aave, DYDX, SushiSwap, um, and the like. Um, in total, I think this is actually out of date even, we're now powering something like 45 plus billion dollars in on-chain transactions. Um, we have reached the 50 plus million end devices, so uh, roughly equate this with end users that we're powering through uh, all the applications we support. Um, in the 99% of countries worldwide. This one's my personal favorite. I just think it's extremely cool that blockchain has literally complete global reach. Like every country on earth um, is, is using a, a blockchain app that is powered by Alchemy, which is, uh, is pretty cool. Um, and so our mission to, to deep dive on it a little bit more is to bring blockchain to a billion people. Um, and how do you do that? So it all starts with users, um, but actually it all starts with products that attract those users. Um, but actually, it all starts with developers who build products that eventually attract users. Um, and so that's what, uh, what kind of spurs the funnel of, of creation, um, both in the Web3 space and, and more generally. You need talented builders um, who can create amazing things that then attract users that create financial incentive for those developers in the first place. Um, but without the builders to, to make the amazing things to attract people in the first place, there's, there's really not an industry to speak of. Um, and so that's really where we focused our efforts is how do we take the developers that are here and make them as productive as possible? How do we attract new developers by making uh, the kind of environment in which they're building more ergonomic, more enjoyable, um, help them fo focus on building uh, cool products more than they otherwise would be able to? Um, and so, like I said, this is where we've, we've kind of honed in as a company is how do we make this link of the uh, ecosystem growth cycle as powerful as possible using our products and our expertise? Um, and so uh, the challenge for blockchain developers, in case you're not familiar, uh, are really twofold. Um, number one, there is a, a total lack of developer tooling. So things that you would be used to as a developer in the web two or mobile development world don't exist for blockchain. Um, you're pretty poorly supported. Um, number two is node infrastructure. Um, so we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but uh, to connect to a blockchain, to actually work with the underlying primitives, you need a blockchain node. Um, these things are uh, kind of horrible beasts to work with. Uh, they're super idiosyncratic, really hard to run. Um, if you ask anybody who's been building in the Web3 space for any amount of time that's dealt with nodes, uh, they will probably mimic this emoji when they describe them to you because uh, it's really a, a tough thing to deal with. Um, and so what this adds up to is building on the blockchain is a lot like building a website in the 1990s. There is all of this aspiration. There are so many cool things that you can see uh, kind of a step away maybe from your, your abilities given all of these kind of new primitives that are available. But without the right tooling to execute on it, it's really hard to do. It weeds out talent. It means that fewer uh, amazing products are being built than otherwise could be. Um, so to deepen that analogy even more, you know, with rudimentary tools, like really you can only build rudimentary things. Um, we've seen in the blockchain space, there are so many talented people uh, kind of focusing their energy on it that they're able to build amazing things anyway, but with tons more effort than, than would be possible and, and maybe not even achieving their, their kind of full heights. And so our goal really is how do we up-level the tool set, right? We replace your hammers and chisels with power tools um, with these large machines so that you can build the, the kind of true epic version of, of what you got in the space to build in the first place.
Um, and so that's really what it comes down to is we're empowering builders. Um, we want to take your aspirations and help you get there by up-leveling the tooling that you're using and doing so. Um, and so to zoom in on node infrastructure a little bit more um, for those unfamiliar. Um, so really, this is a critical link uh, for Web3 and for blockchain development in general. Um, what you really want is to be able to interact with the chain. Um, as a developer, though, sadly, you're over here not communicating with the chain directly. You need this piece of software called a blockchain node to do so. Um, and really, there's a lot of problems with that piece of software. Um, tons of downtime. They're not very scalable. Um, and we can dig into data correctness and why that matters in a second. Um, I know we, uh, we want to leave a lot of time for questions, so I'll, I'll kind of breeze through this at the top level. We can dig into it more if people are interested. Um, as far as downtime, uh, you know, anyone who's run nodes can tell you they tend to have a, a, a kind of tendency to, to go down at the worst times. Like you have a launch, your node is going to go down. It's 2 or 3 a.m. and you need sleep, your node is going to go down. Um, and so in benchmarking, like nowhere near the kind of standards of reliability that uh, a real production application needs from their infrastructure. Um, and so what we tried to do is uh, replace that with infrastructure that does meet those, meet those kind of production needs. So taking the, uh, the kind of unreliable baseline of, of a standard node and up leveling it with what we call our uh, Alchemy Super Node, our kind of enhanced product. Um, another challenge here is scalability. So, um, you know, reliability is one thing, but let's say you uh, are kind of in hyper growth and scaling from your first hundred users to your first million. Uh, the kinds of needs you're going to have from your nodes and your infrastructure are going to change pretty dramatically. Um, one of the worst things about blockchain nodes is uh, they're a, a very immovable unit. So it takes uh, two weeks in the best case to sync a new node from scratch. And so if you're starting with one node and you need to double your traffic, if you're not predicting it two weeks ahead of time, uh, you can be hosed in a lot of cases. Um, and obviously with hyper growth, uh, you're not going to be able to predict things two weeks ahead of time, things uh, move way too quickly for that. Um, and so what we saw is there's, there's really a need for something that scales instantly, that has the kind of elasticity that people are used to from the web world. Um, and that's, again, where uh, kind of Alchemy Supernode has come in um, as a solution. Um, and then finally, there is this issue uh, of data correctness. It's, it's kind of a heady uh, technical issue. Um, but if anybody's interested, would, would love to field questions about it um, afterwards. The kind of core issue here is um, blockchain nodes are each individually syncing with the chain. Um, and so a lot of people think when they start out, if I have 10x the traffic, I'll just use 10 different nodes to serve it. But the problem is each of those nodes has slightly different information on it, which means if your user is getting information from each of those nodes, the information they're seeing is going to constantly change. Um, so one very specific example of this is um, you might want to purchase a CryptoKitty or any NFT um, and you make a request uh, to purchase that CryptoKitty, which uh, basically sends ETH from your address and adds that CryptoKitty to your account. The problem is if you have this kind of uh, data incorrect infrastructure, when you reload your web page, uh, a request to fetch your new balance might go to one node that has seen the transaction where you bought the cat. And the request that goes to see the new owner of the cat might go to a different node. And so you can end up in a state where it looks like your money is gone and you didn't receive the NFT that you purchased, um, which is horrendous UX. It makes you think that your money has been robbed uh, and that Web3 is a horrible thing you never should have ventured into in the first place, when really it's just an artifact of um, some kind of poorly thought through infrastructure. Um, so again, the case where Alchemy Supernode can come in and solve the day. Um, by correctly tackling the infrastructure problem um, and thinking through the kind of native challenges of Web3, um, we can deliver a, a great overall experience for both developers and users who are consuming their applications. Um, and so this is where Alchemy Web3 comes in. We could probably have an, an hour long talk on, uh, sorry, Alchemy Supernode. We could probably have an hour long talk on just Supernode and what we're doing on the infrastructure side here. Um, Cause it's really, really cool uh, kind of technology that we've built out over the last three, four years. Um, but just to hit a couple of the major points, um, one is uh, we kind of bring uh, distributed systems thinking and distributed systems technology to the blockchain space. Like how do you build out Web3 native infrastructure, but using distributed systems techniques? Um, the other thing we do is we've, we've built out what we call our uh, box Nodi service. So this helps solve the data consistency problem. Uh, and basically what we're doing is we have a kind of proprietary algorithm um, that this Vox Nodi service runs. It has each piece of our infrastructure vote on what the consistent view of the world is, kind of like a mini consensus algorithm for those, uh, those who are blockchain aware. Um, and that uh, kind of decides what real-time information our API can serve. Um, so like I said, pretty, pretty dense and pretty technical, but happy to go into more detail if, uh, if people are interested. Um, 
so beyond just Alchemy Supernode, um, which we touched on, uh, there are a number of, of kind of higher level developer tools that we've built out um, as we've understood the kind of deeper um, and higher order needs that uh, folks have when they're developing in the blockchain space. One is Alchemy Build. Um, just to summarize, it's basically uh, active debugging tools. So as you build smart contracts that you're deploying to the blockchain, you want to be able to debug what's going wrong with those smart contracts. Um, as you broadcast transactions to change state, you want to understand that as well. And so Alchemy Build is basically, I have a problem. I know I need to debug with smart contracts and transactions. I can jump in and do that kind of active debugging work, no problem. Um, its sister product is Alchemy Monitor. So this is more passive debugging. So um, I want to check the state of my blockchain applications. I want to understand if they're performing well, if they're uh, kind of hitting the right thresholds of uh, kind of success percentages versus errors. Um, and uh, ideally move from being reactive as a developer, I'm kind of having users, uh, user complaints be my, uh, my way of, of paging uh, when something goes wrong. And kind of notice things that are wrong before they uh, before they're notified to me by by my users. So more of the, the passive debugging um, with some nice usage analytics built into, so you can see uh, kind of where your product is growing in the world and how quickly. Um, another piece of our suite is uh, what we call Alchemy Notify. So this is basically enabling blockchain developers to build out push notifications. Um, uh, you know, one thing that we've seen is a lot of the the archetypes that make a, a product successful in the Web two space are actually really hard to build using Web three. So something as simple as push notifications using blockchain data is actually really, really hard to do. You need to stand up custom infrastructure, uh, do what's called block watching. It, it tends to be something that would uh, take up an entire engineer, if not a team of engineers time, um, which obviously isn't something that every startup can dedicate uh, resources to. Even large ones struggle to do this. Um, so Alchemy Notify basically abstracts away all of the complicated Web3 specific work. Um, so all you need to do is configure iOS or Android to uh, deliver the kind of final inch uh, to your end users. Um, and this is almost a, a kind of subclass of, of a broader class of, of APIs that we've built called enhanced APIs, um, which are basically uh, net new APIs that enable uh, developers to access new information uh, or in more powerful ways than they would be able to using blockchain nodes directly or using uh, the chain's kind of native APIs. Um, so one really common example of this is uh, if you are running a, a blockchain wallet and you want to show your user every interaction they've had with the chain um, in their history as a user, um, it's actually deceptively hard. So a super uh, kind of common use case that people want to build out. But to show that information, you need to crawl every single block, look at every single transaction and look for the user's address. Um, so for a chain like Ethereum, uh, it takes, you know, a billion to 10 billion operations just to show maybe the seven or eight transactions that you've made as your, in your history as a user. Um, whereas with our uh, full transaction history API, you can get it in 10 milliseconds uh, with a couple of parameters. So um, that's an example of kind of what we're trying to do with enhanced APIs, which is make these uh, really intuitive use cases um, possible uh, much more easily with some super powerful uh, inf infrastructure and APIs. Um, cool. Um, so the first question is, uh, I know you guys just announced, um, you raised like a uh, 250 mil, um, at a uh, $3.5 uh, billion evaluation led by ACC and Z. Um, that's, um, that's really exciting. Uh, and also I read the article uh, from TechCrunch saying, actually, uh, I think it's from uh, your CTO, Joe Lau, many, uh, mentioning that uh, the 80 mil that you raised from the previous round you are now even touched because you guys are so profitable, All right? So my first question is around the, the recent raise. Um, so what are your plan to use uh, the money? Despite the success we've seen so far and that the space is seeing more broadly, um, there's a sense on our team and, and elsewhere that this is very much just the beginning. So we expect a year from now um, that the uh, teams who are building uh, in blockchain, um, likely uh, you know, 99 plus percent of them won't exist yet. Um, and so really what we're trying to do with, with that money, both from our, our B and our C, is invest super heavily in the community, make sure that we're playing an active part in the growth of the ecosystem. So um, we're really investing in building out content and tutorials for new developers, developing free resources for teams that are getting started um, and kind of at the start of their journey building on blockchain. Um, and so the goal is really uh, how, do we, how do we invest back in the community, um, play an active role in its growth, um, and make sure that we're playing a, a significant part in that, uh, that kind of continued growth over the next year and beyond. Yeah, um, makes sense. Uh, uh, so the next question I have is, um, what do you um, think is like the main like uh, competitive advantage uh, compared to other competitors in the space like Infura? 
Yeah, really good question. Um, so for what it's worth, Infura has done an awesome thing for uh, the blockchain space and for Ethereum in, in particular. Um, I think Ethereum uh, as a blockchain probably would not be where it's at right now uh, without the role that Infura played early in its life cycle. Like basically they took uh, a situation where developers had to run nodes themselves, spend ton of, tons of collective time uh, on that kind of undifferentiated task. And they were able to, to solve kind of the first step uh, in, the, in the direction of, of improving that experience. Um, so I think hats off to Infura in, in that way. Um, I think, you know, there's a bunch of things that we do that our competitors don't. Um, we have higher order developer tools that allow you to do tons of things beyond infrastructure. Um, really, I think the, the key differentiator though is um, we've built out our infrastructure from scratch uh, with kind of key knowledge of, of what developers needed from it. So before we ever wrote a single line of code uh, more than three years ago when we started out the infrastructure platform, we did something like 150 developer interviews. We spent like weeks talking to developers about what their problems were with infrastructure, what was failing with uh, the, the options at the time um, and designed our system with that in mind. And one of the things actually was that the data consistency issue that we, we mentioned um, with CryptoKitties and other projects where you have this kind of really rough user experience with flickering data because of the way infrastructure is designed. Um, that was and still is a, a problem with, with a lot of the kind of major competitors out there. Um, and so really this, this kind of Web3 native distributed infrastructure, um, in addition to the fact that we have these higher order developer tools is a, a pretty key differentiator there. See, yeah, thank you for the answer. Um, so the next question, uh, next question is um, more on the, um, like the, um, the customer front, like uh, what are your um, thoughts on kind of the institutional adoption um, and uh, what are you guys doing to enable or accelerate the institutional adoption of blockchain technology? By institutional adoption, could you mean like enterprise, like large traditional enterprise, enterprise yeah. in general? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I think we, we've seen, uh, you know, even three years ago when we first started building out the, the developer tooling, enterprises have been tiptoeing into the space. Um, I think there's enough interest about what blockchain enables that most major enterprises are uh, at least experimenting with what blockchain can do for their organizations. Um, I think the major barrier is um, kind of what we're trying to tackle, which is the, the right abstractions didn't exist for those enterprises to be successful as they were exploring how to leverage blockchain most effectively. Um, and so I think one of the big things is, you know, we need to help these enterprises come into the space and be successful with the right tooling, with the right abstractions so that um, they can see the right ROI as they try to, to build blockchain into their efforts more broadly. Um, but I think the, the kind of skies are, are sunny there. Like, I think there is still tons of interest uh, every day. Uh, it seems like new, uh, new projects are being announced by extremely large players like TikTok has announced a major NFT uh, plays. Twitter has announced the, the intent to build out something there. Um, Walmart is doing things. Maersk is doing things. Um, so across industries, uh, kind of across use cases for blockchain, there's a ton of interest and uh, only seems to be growing day over day. Yeah, definitely. There's uh, quite some interest um, from companies and starting to kind of uh, um, think or actually get into the blockchain. Uh, that being said, um, I think the following question is more on the, like, the consumer end. Um, what's your um, thoughts on like a mass uh, consumer adoption? I think the slide deck you mentioned about the 1 billion um, people um, and what's your thoughts or uh, Alchemy's um, thoughts there uh, and how to enable blockchain technology uh, for no tech people? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think there are a lot of hurdles to jump through in improving user experience on Web3 applications. I don't know how many people here have used dApps or other uh, other Web3 apps, but um, typically like your your first experience as a new user when you want to use a game or some other product is you need to go off and download a wallet. You need to understand uh, two or three new concepts. And so the, the hurdle jumping into a, a blockchain enabled product as a user um, is a lot higher than it is for other Web2 applications in a lot of cases. So I think it's a testament to the power of blockchain that despite that so many users have onboarded, like there are so many amazing things that you can do in DeFi with NFTs, um, other blockchain enabled, enabled products that people are willing to learn about these super dense concepts, spend two or three hours onboarding. Um, but I think the, the major hurdle is really like that, that um, onboarding lift needs to be lowered as much as possible. 
um, and the, the kind of continued uh, kind of mental overhead of being a user of blockchain products needs, needs to be as low as possible. So I think um, honestly, like more, more people like the folks at Stanford who have like really keen senses of, of product, how to build scalable products for lots of users. Like I think that kind of eye is the next wave that's going to help push forward the, the kind of advancement of blockchain um, and really unlock the, the next kind of like order of magnitude of users that'll, that'll come into the space. Yeah. Awesome. And I think that's perfect for my next question is um, since this is more kind of education series of our um, Stanford Blockchain Accelerator program. Um, so what uh, do what do you think uh, are some of the interesting domains or ideas that our students can work on uh, for like startup ideas? Yeah, super good question. Um... I think there's a, there's a lot to be done. I, I mean, all over the place, right? Like the, I think the two verticals that have been most successful so far are DeFi and NFTs, um, like playing with the kind of financial primitives that you can work with in blockchain. And then um, kind of the, the concepts of ownership and, and the applications of that that come, uh, come with NFTs. Um, so I think despite the fact that those are, are two that are kind of most explored in terms of, of uh, attention and talent, I think there's there's still tons to be done there. Um, like most of what's been done in NFTs so far, not to speak too broadly, is is basically uh, tokenizing collectibles, like turning art and other collectibles into NFTs and creating a business model off of that. I think there's tons of different applications uh, of applying NFTs to totally uh, totally kind of uh, other kinds of of, of assets. Um, so doing uh, you know contracts or tickets as NFTs. Um, being able to build NFTs into uh, products that have communities that are gated um, and using NFTs as, as the way in. Um, so I think, you know, I would still say like NFTs and DeFi, probably the most approachable just because there are large communities. There's lots of resources on how to kind of sink your teeth in initially, but there's still a lot of room to explore um, new applications, new ways of using those primitives to build um, kind of completely new, new products that frankly can touch like any interest industry that people here are interested in. Um, so I think like would would uh, try to take those concepts and apply them maybe to um, not specifically art or collectibles, maybe not specifically finance, um, but take the things that kind of empower DeFi and NFTs and, and build out things that are more interesting um, in your own domains. Yeah, may make sense. Um, thank you, Mike, for for the, for the answer. Uh, actually, right now we'll just open the floor for questions. We'll go down the list. Actually, there are a lot of good questions on the chat. We'll just go down the list on on the chat. But Actually, you, Kirsten, before we jump in, do you, uh, Nitish, any any thoughts on that last yeah. question? By the way, as somebody who's a little bit newer to the space, yeah. curious, um, what do you think? Yeah, about uh, the question regarding um, the like the new space that folks could venture into. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think Mike hit it pretty well in the head. There's a lot of really built out communities around DeFi and NFTs right now. Makes a lot of sense. I think. One of the, the spaces I'm most excited about personally within the space of blockchain is actually privacy. So there's a lot of really cool work being done here. Um, I think actually one of my inspirations for getting into blockchain was actually Dan Benet, who, who teaches here. And he talks about how blockchain is a mixture of mathematics um, and cryptography, distributed systems and economics. And it really merges these three ideas. I think right now for what it's worth in DeFi, for example, um, my belief, and this is just personally my belief that most money is casino money right now. Like I don't think anyone's financing their house with, uh, you know, um, Ethereum tokens or, or Bitcoin. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in terms of how can we sort of prove um, prove facts to be true on the blockchain without necessarily exposing um, sort of sensitive metadata or internal state of programs or of customers' data. Um, you know, you wouldn't feel comfortable exposing your bank data on the blockchain. You wouldn't be exp comfortable exposing your personal metadata. So how can we go about making blockchains more private and more sort of safe and accessible for the larger populations of the world? That's been a, a sort of sector I've been most interested in, but I think... Um, to kind of like cap off my answer, I think like we're at the stage in crypto and blockchain right now where we were with the internet in 1999. When the internet started, most people were so psyched because you could read your favorite newspaper online. And that was so cool, right? Until some genius discovered you could write to the internet too. And then came Facebook and Twitter and all the interesting social platforms that took the internet from skeuomorphic to really digital native. Um, we're at the stage in blockchain where everyone's trying to use blockchain for very real life use cases, right? Like ownership, um, you know, pay peer to peer payments, identity authentication. But we haven't even explored the 99% of use cases that could exist in blockchain that are completely crypto native. It's like thinking in 4D to us. Imagine trying to think about writing to the internet or Facebook and Twitter in the 1980s. It's just, you couldn't do it. And so I'm really excited to see like where we're going to progress in the next 10, 15, 20, 50, 100 years with blockchain, um, especially that 99% of use cases that we haven't even touched yet. Um, and I think that's what I'm most excited about. 
Thank you, Nitesh. Uh, and we'll start the question on the chat. As I mentioned before, audience, um, like feel free to raise your hand and ask a live question. And also, um, like Nitesh, also feel free to answer some of the questions if you feel like um, you have like more um, experience. Yeah, and, and also one one quick thing, Kun. I did want to. Um, I was wondering if I could share my screen. I actually have a QR code that I was wondering if anyone who wanted to sign up for Alchemy today, if they wanted to scan really quick, um, just in case they were interested. Yeah, let me kind of uh, yeah. share the download. It will only if, it's, if it's too much, I don't. I can just send out an email afterwards, but just thought it might be easier for folks. Yeah, I think I just enabled sharing. Go ahead. Cool. Sounds good. Um, yeah, I guess we can feel free to take questions while this is up for a little bit, just so folks can scan that QR code in case they're interested in signing up and getting on board at Alchemy. Okay. Cool. Um, I will, should we leave this code on or do you want to? I think, I think we can leave it. Do we, you want to leave it up? I think we can just leave it up while we take questions. That's okay. Good. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the first question, we just go down the list. I think the first question is from uh, Greg, uh, Greg Farrell. It's like a question for Mike. Uh, what about your culture at Alchemy? Do you think that has allowed uh, Nitish uh, to kind of yield autonomy and flourish sword in his career? And those words are way too kind. Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, all credit go there goes to Nitish. He's an awesome, uh, awesome guy, awesome intern. He's done a, a phenomenal job. Um, I think honestly, like there's there's a cultural culture here of uh, I think you'll find it at a lot of startups, but maybe uh, done better here than, than most places I've been of autonomy and transparency, I think, uh, which enable basically everybody uh, in the organization to do incredible things. I think we, we hire really talented people and we trust the people we hire. Um, so that means everybody gets a ton of responsibility, a ton of agency and uh, kind of building things end to end. Um, and like from our CEO, CTO on down, there's a ton of transparency in the org. So um, culture of sharing, culture of uh, kind of supporting people as they, as they build and execute in their daily roles. So. Um, I think those two plus hiring ballers like Natish in the first place is, uh, is the, the kind of secret there. And, and Sumi, and Sumi. And Sumi. Cool. Um, I'm just going down the list. Um, um, so another question from the audience is um, Siong um, Eddie asking, what are some ways that game um, that metaverse developers use Alchemy? Um, yeah, and uh, he's, I think, in the middle of making one, so he just want to know some of the resources he can tap, tap into. Nice, really good question. So I guess fundamentally what we build is a, a pipeline for reading data from and writing data to the blockchain. So I think like any interaction you have with uh, a blockchain that you're working with, Alchemy can help with. We'll make it you know faster, more reliable, more convenient, uh, all the things that are, are necessary to games. Um, so I think like, uh, you know, high uptime, uh, highly performant games def definitely benefit just from that uh, kind of well-built infrastructure. Uh, another thing I would call out is we're actually multi-chain um, in our support. So we started with Ethereum. That's what we've worked with for the longest time. Um, but we've actually expanded out to support a number of different, uh, a number of different chains, some of which may be better suited for uh, gaming than others. So um, Ethereum, as I'm sure many of you know, um, amazing, been around for a long time, tons of projects built there, but sometimes expensive to to transact on like uh, you know if you're trading an nft at peak it can cost you three or four hundred dollars just to to transfer the nft um and so uh there are some other blockchains like polygon arbitrum optimism uh, blockchains and layer twos um they're maybe well more uh, well suited for building a game um and fully supported on alchemy um so you can build on those side chains or layer twos in conjunction with uh, with what you're doing on ethereum um, or, or choose from, you know, Flow or Crypto.org, any of the chains we support, um, which I would call it as, as one uh, kind of major advantage of using us. Um, another is, uh, I would check out our enhanced APIs. So um, we actually uh, more recently opened up an NFT API. Um, also, our uh, Get Asset Transfers API is, is really, really helpful for showing users um, kind of their state over time. So particularly in a game, if you're trying to show, like, what is the current inventory uh, for a user uh, or something like that uh, could be extremely difficult to do um, if you're pulling data directly from the blockchain or using another provider, um, but something that we make super easy with those enhanced APIs. So um, I would say like use our API to begin with, it'll make the experience better for your users, um, but particularly like our multi-chain support um, and enhanced APIs will make the, uh, the experience much better for you. 
Awesome. Um, the next question is actually from uh, Akash. Uh, he has a question regarding like uh, DAO. He says there's a huge movement in DAO in crypto space uh, towards DAO uh, and decentralized democracy. Um, and how, how does that like affect uh, alchemy? Uh, you guys think you might adopt uh, some sort of that like governance model? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think honestly, one of the coolest opportunities of being in this space right now is I actually feel like, you know, we get to build amazing products and pioneer, like what does the next wave of games look like? What does the next wave of financial applications look like? But I think that like the arguably bigger opportunity that everybody in this place is, space is playing a role in is what does the future of work look like? What does the future of, of being a company look like? I think DAOs are uh, kind of the seed of, of something really interesting there. And I think by being in the space, by um, kind of constantly figuring out what are the right trade-offs and right ways to engage with this, um, you can kind of actively play a role in uh, what companies as a whole may look like um, in three, five, 10 years. Um, so I think like that that space is fascinating to me. I think it's uh, it's kind of inevitable that uh, the entire work, working world kind of picks up the aspects of, of what DAOs and, and kind of distributed governance are doing. Um, maybe even beyond the working world, right? Maybe maybe even uh, kind of governments and beyond, um, if you take an even longer view on it. Um, as far as alchemy in particular, so I guess two ways that DAOs affect us. One is um, uh, kind of more practically on the business side, we interact with DAOs all the time. Um, DAOs have a need for the kind of infrastructure and APIs we've built. Oftentimes they're uh, kind of in charge of products or other businesses that touch Web3. Um, and so one thing we do is we accept crypto payments, uh, which uh, typically is, is kind of necessary for working with DAOs. They can't deal with uh, kind of uh, traditional financial institutions and, and kind of uh, banks that do KYC in the same way that normal companies do. Um, and so we've tried to meet uh, kind of the unique, uh, unique entities in the space um, where they are and accepting crypto payments. Actually, in some cases, from NFT projects, we'll also accept NFTs as payments uh, if they're like pre-drop and, and need that kind of support. Um, so we're, we're kind of trying to get creative in how we engage with the community from a business model perspective. Um, also, when it comes to, to our own, own organization, um, obviously at the moment we're a centralized company. We just raised a traditional venture round, um, but we're always kind of looking at um, what the right ways to apply the the kind of uh, philosophies and practicalities of DAOs to what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing here at Alchemy. Mike, do you think that Alchemy should become a DAO one day? <laughs> it's interesting. Like, you know, in the long view, I think it's probably inevitable. Um, so yeah, like it, it may not be called a DAO at that point. It'll probably have reached like a, a, a little bit more uh, widespread adoption. But um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll pick up the aspects of a DAO for sure at some point. Okay, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Um, and also the audience, uh, feel free to um, raise your hand too. You can ask a question um, at that way as well, just unmute yourself. So the next question I can see on the chat is, um, what is your um, go-to-market strategy for non-US markets like Europe or Asia? Yeah, really good question. So um, I think there are a, a couple of levels of that. Number one is blockchain is kind of uh, inherently global. Um, so I think by building the best products, by uh, kind of having word of mouth amongst developers, um, a lot of the go-to-market there is taking care of itself. Like our own audience is, is quite global. Some of our earliest projects were uh, based out of Vietnam, like Kyber um, and Axie Infinity, um, based out of India, like our, our good partners at, at Polygon. Um, so I think, you know, very naturally, um, because the industry is kind of inherently um, international, our own business has been international from the, from the get-go. Um, I think one interesting thing uh, there that, that actually impacts it a lot is sometimes particular blockchains uh, or kind of technical products that we could support have a little bit of regionality to them. So BSC, for instance, Binance Smart Chain, um, which is uh, an Ethereum-like chain uh, made by Binance, the, uh, the exchange, um, has a, a pretty huge regional audience, right? They're, they're very popular in, uh, in Asia um, and China in particular. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, by looking at supporting those technologies in addition to, uh, you know, the Ethereum's, the Polygon's, the, the Arbitrum's of the world, um, we can kind of tap into that, that broader market. Um, so I'd say, you know, in general, uh, our product has kind of naturally been pulled all across the world, but there are some kind of key levers we can pull in expanding to other markets uh, more globally. Cool, thank you. Um, Aiden, do you want to unmute yourself? Maybe ask a question. Yeah. Hello. Um, you have your hand raised. Um, Aiden. Um, 
Oh, you can't hear you. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Okay, yeah, we can hear you now. Yeah. All right, good, yeah. Oh, wow. Hi, Mike. Good Hello, to see you. Em, how's it going, man? It's going great. Good to see you guys. Nice presentation. Yeah. Em is another uh, illustrious <laughs> former uh, alchemy intern. Good to see you, man. Another celebrity. Thank you. Yeah. Great stuff. Great stuff. Yeah. Um. Uh, I just had like uh, a, a small question. Um. Uh, as it relates, like you know, like the rise of like blockchain and adoption, because yeah, over the past year, like, uh, it's just been crazy. You know, uh, at least I can see blockchain's mainstream now. Um. I was uh, um. I was like blockchain is like you know, um. I started to be adopted like for different use cases. Um. Uh, I, I see like the big some of like the biggest use is like in private, uh, like, like you know in private companies like you no know, private blockchains. Um, do you think like you know like uh, no different sort of problems like the ones like Alchemy is solving for, for uh, for public blockchains will like you know will will exist on such private blockchains and um, does Alchemy like help like uh, like something like some sort of solution in that that part of roadmap in the long term. So, yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, so I think, like, yes, the technical problems will exist on private blockchains. You may get to the, the point where they, they matter and are unavoidable a little bit slower. Um, so uh, these problems become more obvious with scale in terms of data scale and user scale. Um, and because private blockchains are usually kind of quadranted off to just a particular company or set of companies' data, you might get there a little bit slower, um, but we have definitely heard uh, many times from people in the industry that uh, kind of our solution would be um, kind of well uh, well received by folks building out uh, private blockchains. Um, I think so. In terms of uh, of us building out a solution, it's something we've been we considered for a long time. I think philosophically, there's a little bit of a sense, um, at least it, it's my own belief, that long term public blockchains will win out. Like I think. Um, with the development of the, the internet, as an example, there were intranets, like smaller private internets that companies tried to build um, for their own use cases um, and avoid putting things on the, the public internet. Um, but obviously, in the long term, the public internet won in a, a pretty massive and undeniable way. Um, and I think what it took to get there was you needed the right sets of uh, kind of privacy primitives, the right security primitives to allow enterprises to be uh, kind of comfortable putting their data and their operations um, into the cloud and online. And I think we'll see the same transi transition with, with blockchain. It's really, really hard for a company to get comfortable putting you know, financial data or healthcare data on the blockchain right now. It, it kind of goes back to what Natish was talking about when he talked about um, what's kind of cool to look into and work on. Um, and so I think solving those kind of key problems are, in my mind, a, a longer term kind of better place to put effort um, than necessarily supporting private blockchains. That said, um, like we're practical, like our core, our core mission is to support as many developers as we can in their journey to build blockchain applications. And so if it turns out we're wrong and like our thesis is actually uh, is off for some reason and private blockchains do see a ton of adoption and there's there's use cases for them long term, then uh, for sure we'll support them. Um, I think our stack would extend well to supporting private blockchains. Yeah. And to piggyback off of Mike's point, there's actually a really interesting Stanford startup or I guess a Stanford alum who is a founder of the Stanford Blockchain Club named Alex Pruden, who's working at a really cool startup named Alio Systems. I just dropped a link in the chat. Um, they're actually building a zero knowledge um, compiler and language for developers to build like zero knowledge circuits to ensure privacy on blockchains. So it's pretty cool to see that like, you know, on the topic of privacy, that one of our alums or our founder of the Stanford Blockchain Club is actually now at an interesting back company that's helping to build um, some really cool privacy primitives around blockchains. So just thought it was a really cool kind of add on to um, what kind of discussion is around private blockchains and security as a whole um, in the ecosystem. Um, uh, 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 thank you. Um, um, I was like, maybe, uh, like I had like an awful question I was relating like to, uh, also like to uh, the node infrastructure. Um, uh, like, as, as you know, like, I don't think like there's any uh, sort of like infrastructure on the internet that, you know, that can stay, like that can maintain uptime for long, I mean, for like forever without going down. We just saw that on Facebook over the last, I mean, some, uh, some weeks ago. Um, does like, you know, um, in, and also like blockchain is all about decentralization, like long-term, like um, is Alchemy planning like to uh, release some sort of SDK that, you know, that will allow developers, like for example, like you have your own nodes, but through the, you, the SDK can, you know, do the, can like do like the node management for you without having like to use like the Alchemy infrastructure. Uh, just, you know, so you so, so like you solve like that problem of a uh, single point of failure, just in case, assuming like Alchemy goes down and like, you know, all, its users can't access uh, their their products on the blockchain. Like, 
Like, is that something that you guys have uh, yeah, in your plan? Sorry, I was muted. Um, yeah, really, another really good question. So um, I think circling back, I had mentioned in, in the presentation that, you know, before we built a, a, wrote a single line of code or built any part of this product, we talked to 150 plus developers, like, you know, new developers up to, uh, you know, CryptoKitties, OpenSea at the time, the, the largest decentralized applications. And we, we asked them, like, what are the most important things to you? Like latency, uh, stability, scalability, performance, decentralization, stack rank them for us. Um, and I think 149 out of 150 um, put decentralization at the bottom of the list. They were basically like, give us something that works so we can build products for our users and we'll optimize for decentralization over time. So I think as an infrastructure company, like there, there is a natural evolution, like even step out of web three and go back to web two world. There's kind of a natural push towards decentralization um, to have the highest reliability infrastructure. Like you mentioned, you know, single points of failure are the enemy of high, high reliability. Um, and so, you know, uh, as a company, you might start out with a single server on AWS, then go to two or three servers on AWS in a single region. Then you might go to servers in multiple AWS regions. Then you might go to servers on multiple clouds. So AWS and GCP. Then you might throw bare metal in there. So you're, you're kind of increasing the heterogeneity or the, uh, in a way, decentralization of, of your infrastructure. Um, and so I would say, you know, uh, we are thoughtful all the time about the right steps to be taking, uh, both as a uh, kind of infrastructure company and as a player in the Web3 space there. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, there, there, are, uh, there will be a right time uh, to kind of push toward decentralization. Um, and so I think I yeah, would, would stay tuned for, for kind of more there. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so I think Talaha, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Um, thanks. Hi, Mike and Nitesh. Thanks for um, being here today. My question is more like, if you look at GitHub or Discord developer communities today, Alchemy and Infura are the most popular developer solutions. And Infura is obviously owned by Consensus, which occupies a very critical piece of the Ethereum real estate with MetaMask. So how do you think about the relationship between Alchemy and Infura going forward? And how do you think of competing with them given this dynamic of MetaMask? Yeah, good question. Um, I'm not sure I understand the, the like MetaMask link in particular, but maybe I can take a stab at like, how we exist alongside Infura long-term um, and then circle back on any clarifications you have about the MetaMask piece. Um, I think in general, one of the coolest things about the Web3 community is it is super open and super collaborative. Like if you think about it, to build a blockchain application, you literally need to permanently put your code into a public place where it can never be taken back. Like it is radically open source in a way that I think attracts people um, who have that kind of ethos of building in the open, of sharing and, and uh, kind of helping each other build an ecosystem. Um, so I'd say like fundamentally, uh, both us and Infura um, succeed uh, off the success of the entire ecosystem, off of working together to grow um, and help developers succeed. Um, longer term, like, you know, we're going to build the best products we can. Um, we're going to serve as many developers with that product as we possibly can. And we're going to help those developers through Discord, through tutorials, through um, kind of hands-on outreach, um, help them be successful. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the main piece. I, I'm not sure, like, it, it, I'm not sure how MetaMask ties in, but happy to, to get to that if there's something specific to yeah. No, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Um, young uh, Almond, uh, you can go ahead. Your, um, feel free to um, your result. Um, you have your hand raised. Um, uh, Retail investment back sorry, to you, um, Alchemy's you, vision. Uh, can you repeat the question? I think you muted yourself when you were talking. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I, I was wondering. I was wondering if there's an avenue for retail investors to to invest in Alchemy's vision. That was my first question. Yeah, good question. Not not at the moment, uh, unfortunately. But uh, we'll we'll keep you posted if that ever does uh, ever does happen. Okay. And second question is, what? How do you foresee um, the current state of of regulation in the crypto space um, affecting development within the, the um, blockchain space? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think particularly for, for certain segments of the blockchain space, regulation is is a, a kind of very relevant uh, piece of the puzzle. 
um, particularly DeFi, right? Um, the, the SEC has been no stranger to uh, hinting about or, or explicitly talking about things that are happening kind of in the financial space and what, what blockchain is doing there. Um, so I think, uh, you know, how regulation plays out will be very important. I'm pretty confident, like there is, there is a ton of momentum behind what is possible with blockchain now. Um, and I think as regulators, as, uh, as lawmakers become kind of uh, better acquainted with what's going on in blockchain as, as they themselves become educated on the technology and, and why it's so exciting for builders. Um, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty bullish actually on how um, regulation will shake out. And honestly, I think if regulation, um, if regulation actually comes down in kind of healthy innovation uh, promoting ways, I think it'll actually be good for the space long-term. Um, like there are users who are nervous to jump into blockchain because uh, it does have the, the sense of being a little bit of the, the wild west. There is no regulation, uh, you know, uh, grandmas and, and parents might uh, hesitate to, to throw their money into a product that um, uh, is, is kind of a, in DeFi or blockchain right now. So I think if regulation can come down in a way that still allows people to innovate, to do the things that they're doing in DeFi and other spaces right now, um, it could actually be a lever that helps uh, inflect products into the next kind of wave of, of user growth. Um, but of course, uh, there are question marks there, so it's, it's worth paying attention to. Cool, thank you. Uh, actually, there's uh, one question that uh, I saw from the chat, it was like asked by two people. They're asking, they're curious about, um, it's from Akash and Ian, like they're both uh, curious about your thoughts on no code smart contract tools. Um, I think phenomenal idea. Like uh, as a thing to focus on uh, as part of an accelerator or as a business, uh, I think is really interesting. Like fundamentally, I think the two things that need to happen for the blockchain space to, to see the next like order of magnitude of growth are, um, user experience needs to become much simpler to understand and developer experience needs to become much simpler to understand. So I think if you can, if you can unlock the total number of people with great ideas and talent that can, uh, can build on blockchain with no code solutions, um, I think that's, that's potentially a, a massive, massive thing. Um, I think it'll be pretty difficult. Um, like I think uh, no code solutions in general are hard to get right doing so with things that are as complicated as, as blockchain is no easy task, but um, I think it's a, a really valuable thing to, to kind of pursue. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Nitesh. I think you muted your health. Oh, I was just gonna say basically one thing to note is, yeah, I think with the evolution of any space, right? Like we saw with the, you know, Web2, um, when Web2 accelerates, we're naturally going to see the onset of new low code, no code tools to allow those who may be more non-technical to at least scrap up MVPs in, in a short amount of time. I think we're at that stage in blockchain where like people are still just trying to understand like how Solidity even works, like, you know, how, how the actual nature of, of smart contracts work, immutability, um, you know, the, the nature of just the language. And I think that like as, and then and that, that too for Rust and Go and a lot of the other implementations. So I think like as we see the tra like space transition, I think low code and no code tools are actually going to be increasingly important. So I kind of just want to piggyback on that and say that I think that it's going to take some time for folks to really like get a sense of how we're going to build the best um, level of distractions for folks who may not be engineers to start building the blockchain themselves. Well, thank you. Uh, so almost out of time. So the last question I see is also from several people is probably for both Mike um, and Nitesh is what are your, some of your suggestions and recommendations for uh, developers or students, the CS students trying to break into the blockchain uh, space? Yeah, really good question. Um, I would say like simply uh, step number one is, is start building. Um, like I think there is a lot of a lot of space to explore in what's possible using blockchain and the things that have been built uh, above even the base layer at this point. Um, so I'd say like there are great tutorials on our docs uh, for getting started with specific use cases. Um, I think great to get your hands dirty and, and start kind of understanding where the prickly edges are and where you can contribute as an individual. Um, so I'd say like start building, check out tutorials. There's lots of great resources out there. Um, as you do build, definitely join our Discord. Um, we have a really active community there. Natish, me, our entire team is super active in, in supporting. Uh, we'll always answer all your questions. Don't worry, we make sure of it. For sure, well, you'll be super well supported there. Um, and, uh, and beyond that, like engage with the community. I think super active community. Um, one of the things that I think is coolest about entering Web3 right now is, is everybody who is building in this space is super accessible. I think by virtue of being on Twitter and by virtue of it being a small but quickly growing space, you can pretty easily get in contact with 
uh, kind of like your hero builders or the, the major decision makers at any product you're using. Um, and so I'd say like the, the accessibility that you have jumping into the space, super high, um, which I think gives you access to a lot of things um, as you start out building, exploring, that, that's really powerful. Um, so yeah, jump in uh, feet first. Um, and if we can help, definitely let us know. Yeah, to add on to that, as someone who also works in the tutorials here at Alchemy, um, both some of the smart contract development and some of the DApp development, I actually, through my own clunky process of trying to understand like what the heck a blockchain is all the way to like building smart contracts, I actually created a really helpful guide that I just linked in the chat um, for anyone who's looking to like just go from zero to hero. So if you have absolutely no knowledge on how blockchain works, um, following this guide that I put together through my own learnings should probably help you get up to speed on like how you can start building. Um, I found it to be pretty helpful, some of the resources in there, but truthfully, it is like a lot of Google searching. It is a lot of like running into bugs, a lot of, you know, just um, crazy stuff happening and just like lots of long nights, just trying to go down different rabbit holes. But eventually I think the, the kind of reassuring thing to keep in mind as you're in this space is eat, like no matter who you are, um, you'll always be behind. Like you'll always be like, you'll never know what everything is. Like you'll never know everything in the crypto space. There'll always be like 10 things. Even if you think you know crypto, there'll be 10 things you've heard, you never heard about which people are talking about. And so I think it's reassuring to know that like, even though some people seem like they're super well literate on blockchain crypto, um, they don't have everything figured out and everyone is still learning. And I think one of the beautiful things about being in Web3 to Mike's point is that since it's such a rapidly growing space, as long as you're just keeping up, like as long as your leaders are just keeping up with the news, you understand what a blockchain is. Like you're already ahead of like 99.9% .9 of people. Like by virtue of listening to this talk, like you have a really good understanding of blockchain by now, probably that like most people don't. And you should pat yourself on the back because that's really hard. Blockchain is like not an easy thing to understand. So just keeping up and trying to, to stay in this space um, will pay dividends in, in the future, especially if you're looking to like get a career in blockchain or maybe you want to build something of your own. Um, but, it, you know, because it's so rapidly growing, there's a lot to still learn. So, um, yeah, definitely would recommend just trying to dive in feet first, as Mike says. One, uh, one final note, which I should have mentioned when you asked what we were going to do with the resources from, uh, from our recent raise, uh, Kuhn, is uh, we're hiring super aggressively. We're trying to grow our team and our headcount as much as we can. There are so many opportunities for things that we want to build, um, and we need great people to do so. Um, so for internships, full-time positions, um, definitely reach out. Um, we are uh, trying to bring on as many amazing, amazing people as we can. Um, so growing, growing as fast as possible. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mike and uh, Nitesh for um, being here today and sharing with us. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll welcome me. Sorry. Um, sorry, I have, I have one more question. Can I ask a question? Um, go ahead. Is that okay? Um, so I, I just your opinion on proof of stake versus versus proof of work. Um, I I'm I'm under the impression that in order for in order for like immense scalability, like with innovation, proof of stake seems to be the best avenue to go as opposed to proof of work. But um, Ethereum has done such such a great job already on, on a proof of, proof of work um, um, consensus mechanism. But it seems like other projects like Solana and, and Cardano and et cetera um, sort of made a lot of progress in such a short space of time with the proof of, um, 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 with proof of stake. I just kind of wanted to, to get your opinion on that. Yeah, for sure. Big, uh, big question for the end of the uh, end of the talk, but uh, no, it's it's a really good one. Um, so I don't know if you, you've seen y'all, but actually, uh, so Ethereum for a long time now has been working on a migration to what they call Ethereum 2.0, um, which is intended to solve a lot of the scalability issues that the layer one has seen. Like basically, layer one been super successful, where the most developer adoption of Ben has been. But if there's been one kind of uh, chink in the armor, it's been that as it's scaled, it's gotten very expensive and relatively slow for a lot of applications. So Ethereum 2.0 is adding sharding and lots of things that directly uh, contribute to scalability. It is also moving towards proof of stake. Um, so proof of stake, like I think there are a lot of merits to both actually, um, but I think it's very telling that Ethereum, you know, probably most uh, definitively the most uh, 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 kind of used blockchain uh, from a developer's perspective is moving from proof of work to proof of stake. Um, but that being said, like, you know, Solana is actually technically proof of history. There's a lot of kind of interesting research and development that's going on at the consensus level. So I would guess like proof of stake is probably only V2 of what's going to go on with consensus mechanisms. Um, so, you know, uh, professors at Stanford, PhD students, uh, undergrads are probably going to be doing research on this for a long time, improving the under, uh, underlying mechanisms uh, of consensus. So um, a lot, a lot still to be done there, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we actually went uh, five minutes over and uh, there's still some questions that didn't get answered. They just so uh, show like so much interest in alchemy. 
uh, um, in the Stanford um, community, a blockchain community, and Stanford students, which is um, which is awesome. Uh, so thank you so much, Nitesh and uh, Mike, for for your time, and thank you, audience, for uh, coming here and attending this event. Um, so um, yeah. Thank you. I learned a ton, um, and thank you for sharing us everything about. Yeah, and I know, I know I'm going to be sending out an email after the event with a lot of resources for you guys. So a lot of you guys are like, "Hey, how do I start?" Um, I'm going to send a lot of resources to get you guys actually started. Um, and then feel free to find Sumi, Atem, or me anywhere around. Um, we're happy to always answer your questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks yeah. so much for having us, guys. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye.